After almost eight years, the Five Nights at Freddy's movie has finally released, and it was great, but also filled with so many easter eggs and references to everything FNAF. We even know when and where this movie takes place. So let's rewatch the Five Nights at Freddy's movie and point out all the little things that you might have missed. Quick disclaimer, first, of course, spoilers ahead for the entire movie, so make sure you watch it first, you have been warned. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and finally, we begin with the Universal and Blumhouse logos, which are both glitching out, and yes I've looked through and there's unfortunately nothing in any of the glitches. We truly begin with a frightened Freddy's night guard, played by Ryan Wrinkley, opening the vent in the office which is actually connected to multiple vents that go through the entire pizzeria. Oh, then, oh yeah. yeah. Right there, which starts a, a series of ductwork that travels all around uh, the pizzeria, and yeah. pop out in different parts of the, the dining room so and the storage cool. room and the hall. Wow. An animatronic starts banging on and eventually breaking through the wall, which of course hurries the night guard and he begins to crawl through the vents, which itself is a small reference to Sister Location's gameplay, where playing as Mike, in order to travel between rooms you have to crawl through vents. We then see the main desk in the office, which is a lot bigger than the first game. I won't go into detail of the entire room until we see it more in the film, but for now we can see the Celebrate poster from the first game hanging on the wall. Bonnie now with a non-copyright guitar compared to the guitar originally used in the original poster. A fan, scrunched up paper, and a red cup all nods to the first game's desk too. Next to the camera monitors which are connected to a Pelco CM9760 KBD keyboard. In the background you can see the, assumedly, first dollar made at Freddy's Framed, shown better by a photo released from Braden Cawthon, Scott Cawthon's son, where you can kind of make out the Freddy logo on the building. There's also a Freddy's poster saying coming soon, all new stage show extravaganza, Freddy Fazbear, Chica, Foxy and Bonnie performing all new songs and routines, you won't want to miss it, and also another poster filled with a bunch of rules for staff, similar to the rules for safety from the first game. This poster actually mysteriously disappears after Mike's first night, so I can't tell you exactly what the whole poster says, but that in itself could be a reference to how the rules for safety poster in that first game also has a chance to actually disappear too, and change into newspaper clippings for the children going missing. He crawls through to the storage room which we see more of later, entering into the hallways circling the back end of the pizzeria, unaware of Foxy the Pirate Fox following closely. He runs to the staff exit where he hears Foxy hum a tune, a clear reference to the first game where Foxy will randomly hum a tune throughout the night. A shock to everyone, but this was actually performed by Kellen Goff, the voice actor of Funtime Freddy, Molten Freddy, Glamrock Freddy, and more. It's an original recreation purely for the movie. Foxy walks faster and faster until it catches the guard and knocks him out, putting him into this machine that traps him entirely before attempting to stuff him into one of the suits as the machine is a stuffing machine. It is not a torture device. This is what is actually used on the endoskeletons, for those unfamiliar, the insides of the animatronics to quickly and easily put them into the costumes. The mask on the front is of a greyish Freddy, possibly a nod to the colour of Dreadbear from FNAF VR's Halloween DLC. The night guard attempts to escape by slowly loosening a screw more and more, keep this in mind for later, and unfortunately we cut away. He failed. This scene is a reference to the first game where the phone guy, your guide for the game and similarly to the movie, was the previous night guard, tells you that the animatronics will most likely try and stuff you into the empty suits. We then see the dining area, which I'll get more into later, and pan over to the wall of charred drawings, featuring a surprise appearance of Balloon Boy laughing. There's also two posters of interesting human characters, one of a guy wearing a purple long sleeve and blue jeans, a reference to what Mike wears in Sister Location minigames, and two girls with yellow hair wearing pink clothes, likely another Sister Location minigame reference, this time to Elizabeth, Mike's sister in the games, who is also featured in another picture, this time matching Elizabeth better, with a blue skirt, holding a Freddy's hand, which of course is a reference to how Abby, who's Mike's sister in the movie, holds Freddy's hand later in the movie. And the other interesting picture featuring a kid named David, which could be a reference to the recent FNAF books, whose entire overarching villain is originally made for a child named David. There's also a picture to its right of a pink, purple, and white rabbit, a reference to Vanny from FNAF Security Breach, and below it a house in swings that can possibly be interpreted from one of the sticky notes also from Security Breach. 
which I have been theorizing connects to David and the book's villain in some way. There's also another drawing that features rainbows with eyes, a nod to one of FNAF World's villains, Chica's Magic Rainbow. In the middle, there's of course the image of a happy yellow rabbit, Spring Bonnie, with five happy children, a nod, of course, to the five missing children that were taken by Spring Bonnie, which we did see a news report about in the lead up to the movie that was seemingly cut from it. Tragedy tonight at a local pizzeria where five children who were attending a birthday event suddenly and mysteriously vanished into thin air. Let's head inside for more. You see this exact tragedy play out in minigame form, a reference to how the FNAF games always used to tell most of their story through the minigames, seeing Spring Bunny successfully luring the five children away from the party. We see Pixel Pizzas, a possible nod to the FNAF 6 opening minigames pizzas, or just average pizza droppings, that, that one might be too much of a stretch. Then continuing with the tragedy, we see a purple man getting into the Spring Bunny costume near the door. Similar to the Easter egg in FNAF 4, where the purple guy, for those unaware, is the killer in the games, puts a worker inside a suit near the door. We see in the background of one of the laws, a crane game featuring a purple smiling toy, most likely a nod to the purple guy or Shadow Freddy, a dark yellow rabbit or dog toy, a Freddy-esque toy, a green toy, and another purple toy. Trust me, keep these in mind for later. Spring Bunny is also holding balloons that are the same colors, purple, orange, green, blue, and red, as the balloons in, again, the FNAF 4 minigames. On the clock, it's 1215, which I don't know if it's a reference to anything, but I'm gonna mention it here just in case it is and I've missed it. The only thing in FNAF that's happened on December 15th is FNAF VR's physical PS4 and Nintendo Switch release, which I really doubt it's referencing that. We then cut to a 6am wake up alarm, a clear reference to almost every FNAF game's end of shift alarm, and in this case, specifically FNAF 4's wake up alarm. We see a picture of Mike's nightstand, and that we see better later, of younger Mike, wearing a red and grey jumper, a reference to his grey tank top and red foxy mask in the FNAF 4 minigames, his younger brother Garrett wearing a striped shirt, a reference to the FNAF 4 minigames where Mike's unnamed brother also wears a striped shirt, and their unnamed mother and father, who we'll talk more about later. He also has a book called Dream Theory, which of course is a direct reference to quite possibly the biggest FNAF theory to date by fellow YouTuber Game Theory, that theorised every single thing in FNAF was just a dream in the unnamed brother's coma. This turned out to be wrong as FNAF continued past 4 and didn't really touch on the brother since, but it still remains as Game Theory's most viewed FNAF theory to date. Within the movie, however, it's a book about, well, dreams. And what's read out to us from the book is about how dreams could possibly be you entering a memory that you can then be an active participant in. Basically lucid dreaming, but an actual memory instead of whatever scenario you were previously dreaming. Mike also has a tape player, which he stops once awake. We learn and later that this is a recording of nature sounds to help him dream of him and his family's trip to Nebraska and revisit that core memory in his life, which again we'll get into in a second. He's also been taking pills to help him fall asleep faster, and it being on his nightstand could possibly be a reference to FNAF 4, where pills randomly appear on the nightstand. Mike, played by Josh Hutchison, goes and gets Abby, played by Piper Rubio, who draws a lot of pictures of her and Mike, including one inside of a red airplane, which is a nod to Garrett who played with a toy red aeroplane. Abby's name is of course an anagram for Baby, the animatronic who is possessed by her game timeline counterpart, Elizabeth. Some smaller details in this room are that there seems to be a dent in Abby's door. I don't know if this means anything, after all it could have just been an accident by the set designers, but it's there. There's also an urn in her room and interestingly enough a picture of rabbits above her bed. Could this mean that there's a further connection to Afton that we don't know about yet? Mike then travels to a mall where he works as security. He talks to his friend and co-security guard, note the same attire, Jeremiah, played by Thedeus Crane. The name Jeremiah most likely being a reference to FNAF 2's night guard Jeremy Fitzgerald. The two discuss the specific dream theory, and he then goes to get ice cream from Cindy, played by Julia Bellanova, at ice cream parties, which actually shows Chica's magic rainbow in full. But before getting the ice cream, he notices an afraid young boy, played by Xander Matteo, 
who gets seemingly taken by a stranger. This immediately triggers Mike's past trauma and he rushes and then tackles the stranger, punching him over and over. And this turns out to actually be the father of the child. We then cut away to security footage that dates April 6, 2000, once again confirming that this movie does not take place in the game timeline at all and is its own separate thing, as Mike working at the FNAF 1 location happens around 1993 and he only stays there for about a week. This also goes along with the date for a food registration certificate for Freddy's that dates it back to 1979, which would be close to its opening, unlike how Freddy's only opens past 1983 in the games. Also, April 6th was the date that the filming for the FNAF movie supposedly ended, and the same day that we got the release date for the movie, which speaking of, a social worker, played by Victoria Patenud, calls for Mike's number 27, which could genuinely be a nod to the date of the movie's release, October 27th, considering the previous easter egg. Mike talks to career counsellor Steve Raglan, played by Matthew Lillard, who has a participation award hanging in his office, which I do want to point out because in the trailer breakdowns I thought that it was a degree of some kind, but no, it's just for participation. The clothing Mike and Steve are wearing foreshadows the reveals at the end of the film. Mike wearing dark clothing with a bright tie is the protagonist, while Steve wearing light clothing with a dark tie is the antagonist, both showing the progression of these characters and how they're presented at this very moment. Mike beating up someone the scene earlier, starting dark, but becomes the hero of the story, ending bright, while Steve starts as a simple career counsellor, starting bright, but ends up being the main villain of the story as William Afton, ending dark. In the background, there's a map on his wall of Oklahoma City. Is this where the FNAF movie takes place? I personally disagree for reasons I'll get into later that has more evidence. As a random map hanging on someone's office wall, who we know is lying about who he really is, might not mean that that's literally where they are and could possibly be either where Steve Raglan came from or something. It could take place here, but again, I'll get into later why I don't think this is the true location. On Steve's desk, there's also keys with a rabbit's foot on it. Another to Spring Bonnie, Steve's secret. Interestingly, when announcing Mike's last name Schmidt, Steve freezes up. He studies Mike for a second, almost like he knows his last name and is wondering if it's actually the same Mike Schmidt that he seemingly knows, and once realizing that it is, he immediately switches the conversation and asks Mike if he wants coffee, never finishing Mike's last name. He then begins his strategy and quickly says that Mike's options are very limited, and then gleefully suggests working at Freddy's. This all might suggest, to me at least, that Mike is actually an Afton after all, and something happened way earlier in the past between William and the Schmidt parents to cause them to gain custody of Michael. There is no other reason William would be acting so strangely to that last name and after recognising the now grown Mike. And it would make sense considering William specifically targets Garrett just for seemingly a random kill. With this line of thinking, it was possibly as payback to the Schmidt family for taking Mike. I think it's too much of a coincidence to be in a different state, which again we'll get into later, and specifically where they're camping, and then working at and committing the murders in Freddy's, which is in a different state, and that state happens to be where Mike and his family, aunt, etc. live. Garrett was a targeted kill, and there's no other reason for William to know that Garrett's last name was Schmidt either, so I doubt that it's only because he realised it's a murder victim's brother. Steve then gives his full proposition, including saying the pay isn't great, a nod to FNAF 1's pay in the games being only $120. $4 an hour for 5 nights, which was how game theory determined the game took place in 1993, and that they were paying you minimum wage. Mike says that he can't do nights, and Steve says that's such a shame, further showing that William wants him to be close to Freddy's and connected to him again. Mike drives in his 1998 Honda Accord and notices a notice of delinquency, which is a legal notification that payments for something are overdue. He needs a job, and soon. Abby's babysitter Max, played by Kat Connor Sterling, leaves and Mike goes to see Abby, sitting on her bed. Abby interestingly says you're sitting on my friend, which with the context given later on in the film could possibly imply that she was possibly seeing the blonde hair kid who possesses Golden Freddy, or maybe even Garrett, sitting on her bed, which we do learn something similar happening later. This is one of those things that could mean something or could just be justifying her not being surprised to see ghosts later, as it's just her imaginations coming true. Let me know your theories in the 
comments. Mike takes more pills and quickly goes to sleep while staring at the Nebraska sign. And we see as Garrett, played by Lucas Grant, plays with a red airplane before being kidnapped by an unknown man who quickly drives away. In the background, we also see Mike's mum, played by Jessica Blackmore, and Mike's dad, played by Garrett Hines. And we also see Mike's dream theory at play here, as young Mike, played by Wyatt Parker, transitions to older Mike. He's fully in control of this dreaming memory. We then get introduced to Aunt Jane, played by Mary Stewart Madison, interestingly wearing purple, which is usually the Afton's colour in the original minigames, possibly furthering the family's connection with Afton, who, along with their lawyer Doug, played by Michael P. Sullivan is trying to get Mike to give custody of Abby to her. She gives Mike documents to sign which shows two links to Minnesota court sites as well as outright mentioning Minnesota. So does the FNAF movie take place in Minnesota unlike being in Utah like both the original games and the novel trilogy? Well we'll answer that at the next piece of evidence later on. Mike later tells Dr. Lillian, played by Tennessee Young, that she clearly just wants the monthly check from the state. He mentions her drawings and Lillian mentions how people pictures hold power for children. That before we learn to speak, images are the most important tool for understanding the world around us, what's real and what matters to them the most. This is of course what is shown later in the film with the animatronics, more so the kids possessing them, using images as a tool and a gateway to understanding the world around them. In the background of this shot, you can also see the 12 times tables and spelling words for the day. Those noteworthy including musician next to Bunny, obvious reference to Bunny the guitarist, puppet, a reference to the puppet of course, with project next to it, which I guess could be a possible nod to the security puppet revealed in FNAF 6, whose project was to protect children, junior and next to it manager, possibly referencing Mike being a pizzeria manager in FNAF 6, Fox, a nod to Foxy, Bear, a nod to Freddy, and Liberty next to Chick, a reference to the Liberty Chica skin in FNAF AR. Lillian tells him to start with finding a job, so he grabs Steve's business card and calls the number to take the Freddy's job. The numbers on the card both contain 555 within them, because no real phone number contains 555 as it's always commonly used in, and actually reserved for, fictional stories due to old films and shows accidentally using real phone numbers, leading to prank calls etc. Mike gets the job, and travels to Freddy's while Steve gives him the rundown of the history, that it was huge in the 80s with the kids but was shut down, not being taken completely down because the owner just can't bring himself to let it go. Mike enters the building, and we see gumball machines and some posters in the background. One with the caption, time to party like there's no tomorrow, and the other one doesn't look like it has one, or I just can't make one out. You can also see the token packages on the side, which can be seen in full on screen here. He heads straight for the office, seeing a poster for the establishment on the way, featuring a repaired Foxy, which was actually planned to be shown in the movie in a flashback at one point, and he enters the office and flips the breaker, turning on the main power for the location. Similar to FNAF VR's FNAF 1 Halloween level, where you have to reset the power by flipping the breaker when it begins to glitch out. Mike turns on the monitors, and in this shot of the office, you can see the black phone, a possible reference to either the phone guy from the first few games, or possibly even another Blumhouse film, The Black Phone. He flicks through the monitors, including a brand new angle of the entrance, showing off the front counter on the left as seen here. It then switches to the arcade where you can see a ton of arcade machines, which I'll get more into later, then to the show stage, which have the same clouds in the background and wall as the original FNAF 1 trailer. Steve finishes the phone call by saying, I'll see you on the flip side, which could be a reference to the flip side from FNAF World, but is most definitely a nod to the phone guy ending his call saying, see you on the flip side too. Uh, okay, I'll leave you too. See you on the flip side. Mike then sees a tape left for him, which actually has the name Fritz fading off behind it, a reference to FNAF 2's night guard Fritz Smith. He plays the Freddy's security training tape, where Kim, played by Bailey Winston, repeats the exact line from Phone Guy in the first game. Welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, a magical place for kids and grown-ups alike, where fantasy and fun come to life. Welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. A magical place for kids and grown-ups alike, where fantasy and fun come to life, 
You can also see that she's wearing a Let's Eat badge, that's from Chica's bib, a general pepperoni pizza badge, individual character badges for Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Mr. Cupcake, as well as some other random badges. In the background of the tape, you can also hear the song Video Games by Guy Belenga. During the training tape, we can see an endoskeleton on the same chair that the previous night guard was in, showing once again that it's indeed a chair for stuffing the endoskeletons into costumes. Editing me here, according to Antom's Insider, the technician in the background is a cameo made by Robert Bennett, who is actually the man who was the lead designer for the animatronics, which him being a technician for them is a cool nod to that. When Kim clicks the Showtime button, which itself is a reference to FNAF VR's Showtime button, which was originally meant to start a performance from the same set of animatronics, the screen glitches, and during it you can pause to see a frame of Freddy staring directly at the camera, with a weird robotic sound. The shot is taken directly from a later shot when Freddy gets tased, and is a reference to the hallucinations that happened randomly in the first game too, while the robotic sound is also taken straight from the ending where Freddy basically roars. <laughs> Mike opens the lockers in the office, he's scared by a smaller toy balloon boy from FNAF 2, whom Mike simply turns around. He enters the main dining area, filled with chairs and seats for customers to sit and eat, all having a star on them just like FNAF 1's chairs. Each booth has an individual animatronic in stained glass. There's a prize corner, a possible reference to Help Wanted's prize corner, next to Mike which contains random plushies, mainly the hex plushies made by Dorco, the masks made by Ruby's, Deerfield Costume Co of Fred Chica, Bunny, and Foxy, and there's also shirts made specifically for the movie and some other random things. Next to the prize counter, there's a neon Let's Eat sign next to the kitchen, which you can see the menu here. Next to that, there's the restrooms, and then of course the main stages featuring all of the animatronics. Before looping back around to Mike, there's also a few posters of the main four animatronics, the arcade room, and the drawings on the wall that we saw earlier in the trailer. There's a Dead Sea Treasure arcade game at the entrance of the arcade, which itself also contains a Cyclode arcade machine, Ski Ball, the original alley game version, the Wheel of Fortune arcade machine, a giant bull pit, a reference to FNAF 6's giant bull pit and the FNAF short story Into the Pit, a Kix Black foosball table, a Genie pinball machine, a King Cool pinball machine, a Gottlieb Royal Flush pinball machine, a The Prizes machine, a centipede machine, an Area 51 machine, and finally an Asteroids machine. That's every single machine in the arcade. By 3am, Mike's already asleep and the radio randomly starts playing static. A nod to the static you can hear and get mostly when an animatronic is moving around in the first game. We return back to Mike's nightmare, which is now infected with the ghosts of the dead kids possessing each animatronic whose faces randomly fade in and out. The names for the children I'm going to take from the game's timeline just for simplicity's sake, and because they aren't named in the movie. Jeremy with bunny ears, played by David Hudson Doddy, who possesses Bonnie. Cassidy with blonde hair, played by Grant Freely, who possesses Golden Freddy. Fritz with orange hair and a hook, played by Asher Colton Spence, who possesses Foxy. Gabriel with a top hat, played by Liam Hendricks, who possesses Freddy. And Susie with a bib, played by Joe Philly Love, who possesses Chica. He asks whether they know the men in the car and they immediately disperse, causing Mike to chase Cassidy, unfortunately falling over, doing the same in the real world as his alarm rings at 6am, the end of a shift. Mike goes home and so Max leaves. She heads to a coffee shop named Sparky's, which is actually a reference to one of FNAF's biggest hoaxes from the first game, that an animatronic called Sparky the dog would occasionally pop up at the door of parts and services. Within Sparky's, Matt Pat from Game Theory is a waiter. Note that his name is Ness, which is a reference to Game Theory's Sans' Ness Theory, which is one of the biggest memes of this channel as it's quite an out there theory. Max is there with Aunt Jane, Doug, and Max's brother Jeff, played by David Lind. Something small to note here is that this is the only time in the entire film that Doug smiles hoping to get something to eat, but when Jane says they aren't eating, Doug goes back into his default upset look. Matt Pat claims that lunch is the most important meal of the day, and when Jeff contests this, he says his iconic line, It's just a theory. A, a game theory! Great cameo. Turns out Max was going to be paid $200 by Jane to try and find something to use in court against Mike, but ultimately found nothing, so Jane isn't willing to pay. But Jeff suggests they go and trash Freddy's to now get $1,000 
dollars instead. This scene was also the very first scene shot in the entire film. As in the first teaser released by Jason Blum, we can now make out the character the camera is focused on is Doug. This is later confirmed by Matt Pat himself. My scene was the first scene shot of the entire production. Day one, scene one, I was there. Back also to another night at Freddy's, and you can hear this drone sound effect when the logo for the place is shown, sounding similar to the drone sound in the main menu in FNAF 1. Here it is side by side. Mike has now put the Nebraska poster up on his wall to help him dream the same dream again, and we see Foxy is coming closer. Again, the five children appear in his dreams and Mike tries to talk to them, but they run again. This time he goes after Fritz, who strikes Mike, causing him to start bleeding. When he looks back up at Fritz, he's got black tears running down his face, a reference to how the dead children were represented in the games, as constantly crying children. This wakes him back up as everything is going crazy and talking in your sleep by the romantics starts playing through the radio. The song was released in 1983, which is a very important year to the FNAF game story. Story. We then see It's Me in the Mirror, a direct reference to the same catchphrase in the games. Mike goes to turn off the power, and Foxy's in the hallway, implying that the strike Fritz did in the dream was actually done by Foxy, much like him falling over actually happened outside the dream. Mike restarts the power and police officer Vanessa, played by Elizabeth Lale, arrives, the buzzer playing the sound of FNAF 1's door lights. <laughs> Vanessa notices Mike's bleeding cut, confirming Foxy actually struck him and helps clean him up. Her police car says GFPD on the front, possibly meaning that the movie takes place in the city of Granite Falls or East Grand Forks, both in Minnesota, so it fits. But like I mentioned earlier, there's the map for Oklahoma City. So is this just something Steve has hung up for an unknown reason, or is it telling us that the location doesn't really matter? Let me know what you think. Also, the 719 on the car is just an individual car identifier that all police cars have. While Vanessa talks to Mike about Freddy's, we can see a dartboard with the darts on 20 and 3, which of course is a nod to 2023, the year that the movie is releasing, and it's also an incredibly important year for FNAF both in and out of the story, with two of the main games taking place that year. Vanessa then hits the showtime button and begins the animatronic performance of Talking In Your Sleep. But when Bonnie strums its guitar, it electrifies and causes the animatronics to emergency stop. Which could be a reference to how in FNAF VR, if you strum Bonnie's guitar, you have a chance of dying. Vanessa then fills Mike in on the children going missing, and later instructs him to simply just do his job and not let Freddy's get to him. When they leave, Jeff calls Max to come and break into Freddy's, now alongside Hank, played by Christian Stokes, and Carl, played by Joseph Poliquin. If you look closely, Carl is wearing a shirt featuring the Midnight Motorist minigame from FNAF 6, which itself includes one of FNAF's biggest mysteries to this day. Also within the shot, you can see a dog in the car, which was actually shown during production to be Max's dog Toby, with a scene or two possibly removed. Here we also see that the cameras turn on themselves, showing that not only are the animatronics haunted, but so is the building, with the light flickers, the weird collapse at the end of the movie, and the monitors turning on themselves. The gang enters into the kitchen before splitting up, and within this kitchen there's actually a bunch of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place branded pizza boxes, and these were actually sold alongside pizza at certain theatres. I don't live in the US so I don't know for certain where, but I do know that AMC definitely had them. Bonnie's eyes open on the camera monitor, and this shot itself is a perfect recreation of the show stage camera in the first game. When Bonnie moves, you can also see a robot behind Chica that might be an endoskeleton, a reference to how an endoskeleton can randomly appear on the cameras and in the office in FNAF 2. In fact, I believe this is the endoskeleton we saw in the security footage promotional video. Editing me here, and that's true. Dorka confirmed it, and that it's an endoskeleton that Scott called Arnold and the crew called Tina. We then see the gang destroying the pizzeria, and during this sequence we can also see an employees of the month board being destroyed, which actually contains a bunch of cameos, containing Dorko, 8-Bit Ryan, Razbowski, Baza, Fusion Z Gamer, DJ Sturf, and John Wolfie. I think the others are just extras or from the film crew, but if not, I'm sorry, I just don't recognize them. Something some people may have missed 
missed was the fact that Chika is actually in the background of this shot, walking behind the fan unknowingly to Carl. Mr. Cupcake is found in the fridge by Carl, and it moves quickly, which actually happens in FNAF VR when a level includes needing to catch the cupcake while it literally hops around you. Carl then turns to see Chika and Mr. Cupcake, their eyes going from plain to a tint of red, which in this film shows that they're on the attack, and they go fully dark red when they're filled with agony and rage. Mr. Cupcake then jump scares and kills Carl with razor sharp teeth, just like the Nightmare Cupcake from FNAF 4. Carl being killed by the cupcake could be a reference to how everyone, including me, has given the cupcake the name Carl, but the movie calling it just Mr. Cupcake basically kills that name. Bonnie then kills Hank in the supply closet a room which in the first game only Bonnie can enter. Small reference there. Jeff then runs into the office and Chica sends the cupcake into the vents to go and get him, which I just want to mention because I predicted it correctly. But even after avoiding the cupcake's jaws of death, he gets cornered and killed by the sprinting Foxy, a reference to the first game's Foxy also sprinting down the hallway to the office. Foxy's jump scare also includes the FNAF 1 jump scare sound. Listen closely. <laughs> Max then enters the building because they're taking their time to return, and Gabriel, Freddy's possessor, tells her follow me, which is a reference to the FNAF 3 minigames where Shadow Freddy tells you to follow me. Max then enters Parts and Service, which contains a lot of easter eggs. The costumes on the floor are actually of Shadow Freddy, in this case not really lore important but just a reference to it, Sparky the dog itself, an animatronic endoskeleton based on Endo 01, the first game's Endo, and then seemingly another Freddy-esque suit. If you remember, these were teased in the intro, and only one is missing, which is the green costume, which in the behind the scenes, you can tell that the other random parts are a greenish colour. Also within this room, there are weird big eyes and this weird looking head that I previously guessed were the Withered's eyes and Withered Foxy's head, but now I think they might be a reference to the old, apparently, FNAF movie leaks, of the giant eyes and a weird head that looks like it could match. Within the YouTuber behind the scenes vlogs, we also see a lion head and an endoskeleton with human parts covering it, possibly references to the mimic, both its tiger rock and burn trap forms. Max then approaches Freddy, as Gabriel keeps telling her that she's getting warmer and warmer. You can see the endoskeleton inside Freddy before Gabriel grabs her, pulling her up and then chomping her body in half. A nod to the Bite of 83 from FNAF 4, and I guess the Bite of 87 too, from FNAF 2. We then cut back to Mike's house, Abby drawing someone on rollerblades. Likely a nod to Scrap Baby with her rollerblades from FNAF 6, who, reminder, her game counterpart possesses. Mike then walks away from the TV, and we can see a sun clock on Mike's wall, possibly a nod to the one from FNAF Sister location where Mike watches TV. Vanessa then arrives at his house to tell Mike about the break-in, and talk to him about the sleeping pills. He tells her about Garrett and how he thinks that he saw the guy who took him, but just doesn't remember it, so that's why he tries to dream that memory to figure it out. Mike confirms that his mum died a while back, and dad died too, implied suicide. Later Max doesn't pick up his call because, well, she's dead, and so he's forced to take Abby with him to Freddy's. He then decides that instead of sleeping he's going to clean up the mess. So he goes into the supply closet and Balloon Boy jump scares him again and he turns it around. I know people are going to ask if it has any significance, but I think it's just a joke in the film and it's not possessed or anything like that. Mike then cleans up and goes back to sleep despite Vanessa's warnings. We cut to a new angle of the hallway, seeing some new posters on the wall, including a poster saying where kids can play forever, a poster of Foxy saving the kingdom, on the other wall a poster of Bonnie as a sphinx and the caption I have sand in my hair, and finally a poster of Freddy with a leaning tower of pizza. One of the spirits then wakes Abby up, and she goes to the animatronics while Mike returns to his dream, now only with Cassidy drawing something into the ground. Mike says he'll give them anything if they show them who took his brother, and when he he hears Abby scream, he turns around, turning back to see the outline of Spring Bunny etched into the ground. Mike then wakes up and rushes to save Abby from the animatronics, with Abby saying how they like pictures and we later see that she already drew pictures before going to Freddy's. It's assumed that Abby already showed them a picture of her and Mike before this, and as stated before, children, and therefore the animatronics, use pictures as a gateway to understanding the world around them. So when Abby tells them it's Mike, who they know from the pictures, 
they quickly calm down and trust him. Something fellow YouTuber Raito suggested was that in this scene you can also see on the back of Foxy's head a piece of tape keeping Foxy's eye patch on, which he believes could be a reference to FNAF 1's Foxy model having an eye patch that kind of just stops instead of wrapping around like a normal eye patch. There's not just the two pictures Mike picks up either, as in the background you can see more pictures drawn by Abby of the spirits. The next morning Mike asks her about them, and she reveals that Cassidy has been talking to her in her sleep as well, and showed her Mike's memory of Garrett. She also mentions how they all just talk about the yellow rabbit, which again is because of the pictures showing the children being best friends with it, and later that night Abby tells Mike that the spirits also told her that Vanessa is nice. Abby and the animatronics then get Mike and Vanessa to help them build a fort, with connection by Elastica playing in the background, which was quite a wholesome scene but in retrospect it's actually really sad. This scene shows that they are just children, doing things that they were never able to do because they were killed early in their life. This scene literally treats the animatronics as innocent joyful children because that's exactly what they are, just children having fun for once. Mike and Vanessa go into the storage room to find tablecloths, and we get introduced to a springlock suit with the face of Ella, the doll that appears in both the FNAF book trilogy and one of the FNAF short stories 1.35am, and as she explains the springlocks are for keeping the animatronic parts in place while someone could actually wear it, doubling as both an animatronic and normal costume. Mike pushes Vanessa for answers but the conversation gets cut short as Abby strums Bonnie's unstable guitar while they're performing Real Wild Child, Wild One by Iggy Pop. Vanessa tells Mike not to bring Abby back again and in a moment of regret he calls Aunt Jane to come take care of Abby while he goes and gets more sleeping pills to return back to Freddy's alone. In the background of a pharmacist you can faintly hear Celebration by Cool and the gang, playing from the speakers. The pharmacist himself is played by Gralin Bryant Banks. Mike then arrives for his fifth night and later on in the night he comes back, which I guess you could count as a bonus sixth time returning, like the bonus sixth night in the games, so he actually does spend five nights at Freddy's. The first time in the entire series that this title has been accurate. We then have a one shot of Mike taking the pills and falling asleep quickly, cutting to the dream where surprisingly the family is happy again, waiting for Mike to join them. Cassidy then tells Mike that they can give him this dream forever if they get Abby in return, which is actually a nice reference to FNAF Ultimate Custom Night, where Cassidy causes William to have a constant nightmare. So no, this wasn't just the spirit bluffing Mike or distracting him long enough to get him in the real world, but Cassidy could have actually done this for him willingly. The Golden Freddy spirit seems to be the most powerful spirit, the leader of sorts, and the main communicator for the others. Something small to point out here is the jump cut from Mike rubbing Garrett's face to Mike rubbing aside Abby's hair. This is of course representing Mike realising that he needs to be focusing on the present and what he has right in front of him, Abby, instead of holding onto the past and letting it take over his life, Garrett. The animatronics then attack Mike and take him to the stuffing machine, which due to the pass guard already loosening it, he's able to unscrew it in time to escape. He then backs up across the room, knocking into Max stuffed into Shadow Freddy, Hank stuffed into Sparky, Carl seemingly either missed stuffing or next up to be stuffed into a random suit, same as Jeff. Golden Freddy then arrives at Mike's house, and yes, this is Golden Freddy, because when Abby says Freddy, Cassie says not Freddy. Note the damage of Golden Freddy is on his left side. Upon leaving, we see that Aunt Jane has likely been killed by Golden Freddy. We then cut to a 1995 Honda Odyssey taxi being driven by Corey X Kenshin, the song in the background being I Wanna Be Down by Brandy. He notices Golden Freddy, but seems to just think it's a costume someone is wearing. Meanwhile, at a police supply outpost, Vanessa Vanessa aids Mike and he confronts her on what she knows. Vanessa reveals that the animatronics want to make her into an animatronic so they can play with her forever, as we cut to Golden Freddy and Abby arriving at Freddy's, seeing Golden Freddy teleport just like the first game. Vanessa then tells Mike that the spirits aren't just possessing the animatronics, but the bodies themselves were also put inside them by the murderer to hide them from being found by the police. She tells him that the murderer can somehow influence them to do things and that his name is William Afton again exactly like the games, and that he's actually her father. Whether this means that Vanessa is actually an Afton in the games too, or whether this is just a change for the movies to make her connection to Freddy's actually make sense without the whole virus infection thing, is something for you to decide yourself. Let me know what you think is the more likely option in the comments below.
though. Either way, in the photo Vanessa shows Mike, we can see the fully fixed spring bunny suit for the first time, and also a younger Vanessa who is interestingly holding the same red plane toy that Garrett has, which could be a coincidence, but then it outright cuts to Garrett's red plane toy as if it's trying to tell us that this might actually be the same plane that William decided to give to Vanessa, possibly so it wouldn't be looked into by police, but also reinforcing that the murderer of the five kids is also the same as Garrett's murder. Also, before I get comments saying I missed this, I've seen it mentioned that the box in the background of the shot could be the FNAF 4 box, but I honestly just think it's a normal box as they're literally in a supply outpost. The animatronics then begin performing as Mike and Vanessa gear up with tasers to shock the animatronics a possible nod to FNAF this location where you, as Mike, must shock them. When Mike says he really messed you up, didn't he? And we cut back to Vanessa, you can hear screams of most likely a young Vanessa. Telling us that William was an abusive father. While Chica takes Abby to the stuffing machine, Mike successfully electrocutes both Freddy and Bonnie. Chica tries to put Abby into the Ella Springlock suit, but luckily Mike shocks her in time. However, the cupcake attacks Mike and knocks him over while Abby continues running. We then get this really cool shot of Fritz turning into Foxy, beginning his hunt as Mike successfully shocks the cupcake too. Abby hides behind arcade machines to escape Foxy, exactly like Charlie does in the FNAF novels, and then hides in the bull pit. Mike tries to find Abby heading towards the exit, only to see the one and only William Afton inside the Spring Bunny suit, which in the captions is just called Yellow Rabbit, a reference to how Golden Freddy, theorized to be an equally old suit, used to just be called Yellow Bear in the files. That's not the only connection to Golden Freddy either, as the two actually have their withered damage on specifically opposing sides. Mike tries to taser him but it doesn't work and instead William pushes Mike back while Foxy finds Abby, only to be shocked by Vanessa. William confirms he killed Garrett and kicks the shit out of Mike. He then wakes the animatronics back up and swipes his knife, a reference to Scream where Matthew Lillard plays one of the murderers and swipes his knife. Vanessa and William then confront each other, William taking off the mask to reveal to the audience that he was Steve Raglan after all, which is simply just an Elias he uses after the murders at Freddy's, similar to his Elias of Dave Miller from the books. Vanessa then shoots Afton and he has no hesitation to knock the gun out of her hand and strangle her, eventually going as far as stabbing her. Abby however draws a picture showing the truth about Spring Bonnie actually hurting the kids and not being their best friend like the previous picture showed. This immediately causes the children to remember exactly what happened, and causes them to turn on Afton. This is almost exactly like the fourth closet book, where one of the protagonists puts together a picture that reminds the children of Afton hurting them, causing them to kill Afton. The animatronics surround William as he yells at them all, until the cupcake leaps at him, taking a bite out of the suit and activating the spring locks. William gets spring locked inside of the spring bunny suit as the animatronics watch him claim that he always comes back. This entire scene is a recreation of the event in FNAF 3, and the novels, where this exact thing happens. William gets cornered and thinks that he's powerful inside the suit, only for the suit to turn on him and kill him. The quote I always come back is also one of William's quotes in the games. The building then begins to malfunction and collapse as William slowly dies. The animatronics now having their full red eyes, and as Freddy creepily roars in rage, the animatronics take William away, while Mike and Abby help take Vanessa out of the still collapsing building. The animatronics taking William away is also taken from the books, with the animatronics taking William away after the spring lock failure. After this event, Abby is doing better in school with some real friends, while Mike and her have a stronger bond. Mike now fully letting go of the past and focusing on being a better brother. Mike goes to visit Vanessa in hospital, saying I don't know if you can hear any of this, as well as other things. A reference to FNAF 4, where Mike visits the crying child, Garrett's game timeline counterpart, in hospital and also tells him I don't know if you can hear me. Back at home, Abby has made a new drawing of Mike, Vanessa and her alongside the four animatronics, all happy together. She asks if they can visit them sometime, to which Mike responds you never know what could happen, which is clearly a reference to them unsure whether they will end up making more FNAF films, which I really hope they do. In fact, a trilogy has seemingly been confirmed by Matthew Lillard, saying that he signed a three-picture deal with Blumhouse and an anonymous source says that apparently 
apparently the second movie is already in pre-production. We then see the final scene of the movie, Cassidy trapping the dying William in a room, most likely turning Spring Bunny into Springtrap by the time of the next movie. This is also a reference to the actual story of FNAF 3. After being spring locked, Afton stays twitching in the room for 30 years before being freed by explorers making a new location based on the rumours of the past establishment. Then credits roll and we hear the Living Tombstones FNAF 1 song, which is honestly incredible to hear and really puts into perspective how far this franchise has come in the past 9 years. We then get a post credit scene with Corey in the taxi and someone knocking on the door. If you listen closely, this is actually the same sound effect as the sound effect you hear in Ultimate Custom Night, after blocking an animatronic. <laughs> The person who then gets in the taxi is actually Balloon Boy. Towards the end of the credit we can hear a remix of the puppets music box, which itself is very interesting and possibly hinting at its inclusion in the second movie. We then hear letters spelling come find me, in the same style as save him being spelled out in the FNAF 2 minigames. And then end of movie. That's it. Every single easter egg and detail that I could find throughout the whole film with additional information from the behind the scenes vlogs released on Dorco, 8-Bit Ryan, Resbe Bowski, Baz, and Matt Pat's channels. I really hope I didn't, but let me know if I missed anything. If you want to catch yourself back up in the story, go watch the video on the left, or you can watch my newest video on the right. Make sure to subscribe, and I hope you enjoyed.